Hello, this is uh, Joseph Schenwald. I'm the author of uh, the Fast Tech Formula to High End Podcast Bookings. And I have uh, the podcast, uh, it's a spirituality podcast. It's this podcast owned by beach.com. And I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Guest Experts on Air.com. And I think you should still definitely listen to this episode, Epic, about here on this business calls architect show where we are discussing we go really deep into the topic of how to go do high-end podcast bookings how to get those why it's important for a businessman for a solo primary and all this and why you can call your business doing it and of course then we talked a little bit about spirituality also which was i think it's very important for every businessman so make sure you head over to this and listen to the episode and hello, fabulous person, Beat Gillette here. I am the host of the Business Growth Architect Show, and I want to welcome you to today's episode where we discuss how to navigate strategy and spirituality to achieve time and financial freedom. Truly successful people have learned how to master both, a clear intention and a strategy to execute that in a spiritual practice that will help them to stay in alignment and on purpose. Please enjoy the show and listen to what our guest today has to say about this very topic. Hello and welcome back. Your host, Beate Schillett, here along with Josef Schinwald, a fellow European with a nice, thick Austrian accent. And today we're going to talk about guest experts on air. How do you use podcasting for success? How do you become a sought after guest what does this even mean for your business strategy and then we'll dive into the second part of the episode where we will talk a lot about mindfulness and how spirituality will play a part in exponentially improving your exposure and short cutting your success Josef I'm excited for you to be on the show welcome thank you very much for your invitation Beate and it's really a privilege to be on your show I think uh, it has to do with the opportunity you get when you are on a podcast, when you're invited, particularly on a podcast tour, the opportunity you get to talk 40 minutes, 30 minutes. And that allows you to create your brand. That's your authority. That's your, you know, when people are not in the room and to talk about you, that is your brand. And when you get so many opportunities to talk and leverage other people's audiences, that means you are creating an authority effect and an impact because also through the social media you have this a smaller clips up to 20 clips for one interview and for that when you are constantly appear in social media and that's not even so necessary because the podcasts they get out they, they go out to 15 different platforms by itself they do the ma marketing automatically but you also get this opportunity to create a content a content marketing strategy for years to come so it's not like the one and only thing. You're not going to become only successful because of the podcast mm -hmm. tour because I have very high level clients like three three times bestsellers and Wall Street Journal bestsellers and I can never claim they did that because I put them on so many podcasts. It's a nice record. Yeah, and I love how you just went right in and, and talked about the power of being on a podcast as you are uh, coming on our show. So tell us a little bit about how does your service work so people really understand what somebody like you does to help them get this authority or make their impact? Yeah, first of all, podcast guesting or guest podcasting, it's the same, is all about public speaking. So I was fortunately so many times on television myself and I, when I was young, I was a tourist guide. So I know what it means when you lose your voice or when you suddenly have three cameras on you and you really you disappear you you know you don't see yourself anymore gone you just look from above and you look you can't really but you look at an empty chair <laughs> it's, it's so uncomfortable but then the more you do it the more fun it gets and that's what the main thing is when you do it you learn fast doing it and then when you overcome the public speaking and for a lot of people and i've heard stuff which probably is not 100 percent true but it's as much you have as much fear of public speaking as from death well, i cannot believe it but it's probably a lot you might want I to know. Run people are terrified of public speaking and i i don't i don't understand give me a microphone 
Yeah, I, I, know, I know. It's it's just the way it is. And the only the only medicine is do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So for somebody now who who thinks about okay, I've I've heard about podcast hosting, right? So I'm a podcast host. I bring people on, and I do this obviously to grow my business, to get my message out. What's in it for a podcast guest? Let's go through that so people really understand the power of what it is that you do. Yeah, <clears throat> what always is like the most is the best if you're on podcast and you do guesting also. When you do guesting, obviously you are leveraging other people's audiences. You know how long it takes to make this episode, so many episodes, then you gather more and more an audience. They come, of course, also because you already might have written a book and you, you did, of course, and you have incredible following on social media and all this, so you get quicker. But if you're not so known yet, they're not so famous like you yet, then it takes a long time to create your own audience on a podcast. But when you go on a podcast tour, and you help sell, have somebody who helps you, and you get three, four interviews a month. And all you have to do really is book yourself in when you get the email. And hopefully these are all best level, high end podcast. You get up to 5,000 audience and said, put your headset on. And then you are accumulating immense audiences, wider audiences in a year, let's say in a podcast tour, half a year. Well, that's, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. You're actually talking in front of hundreds of thousands of people. And if the person who booked you on this podcast knew what he was doing, and he got the only relevant shows where your message really landed well, because they were really interested, because there was a fit between the podcast host, you, and the audience, then you have incredible benefits from it. But it's very difficult to measure unless you are the very best podcasts. I mean, best podcast means they have a very high global rank, very high listen score. They have the best um, guests ever on there. And when you go to the other social media of the host, you will see very, very famous, very popular as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I love this idea of the podcast guesting in the first year. I think I did about 120 interviews in a year uh, because I needed to get this message out to as many people as possible and got the reviews made sure that other hosts knew how to recommend me to other shows. And I I had a strategy that was twofold. My strategy was I wanted to be on podcasts where the podcast host would be a potential client of mine or where I was a podcast on a podcast where the host would elevate me. So talk to me about how you are selecting for your clients what type of podcasts they should be on. Yeah, let's say, I have to give you a few examples. Let's say I have one client who is interesting here to talk about. He is an introvert expert, but he is a sales expert. So he actually teaches sales, not sales people, but the sales leaders. Mm -hmm. He teaches them how to do this really well when you're an introvert. He sees, of course, that all CEOs are introverts and, and people just don't know it. And I believe being introvert is, is a good thing, but even spirituality, because you get your energy from the inside out. You don't need others to get energy. Yeah. But now he asks me, Joseph, I make most money when I'm talking in front of uh, wealth managers, like those who manage a portfolio for the people. And they also sell. Of course, they have to also sell. Right? Everybody's selling in a way, right? So what I'm hearing you say is that there's a very particular strategy. There's a very particular strategy you follow. So you, you look at what the qualifications are, what's the expert status, the authority is of the person who comes to you. And you have said that you have very high caliber experts that are not influencers per se. You know, it's not like a Kardashian type of guy, but it's mostly people that have industry expertise or industry authority in one particular niche. And because these types of things are not as flashy and uh, may I say as sexy as putting makeup on or getting lip injections or the latest biohack. These things about how to be an introvert and make sales have their place and people actually Google and Google search for these types of uh, content because they have that problem that they like to solve, but it's not flashy in that sense. And then they come to you and then you help them to articulate the pitch or the hook. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that because I think that that's one of the things that's most misunderstood in podcast guesting. We get a lot of podcast guest applications and it goes like this. Hey, so-and-so would be a great guest. He can talk about 
how to be a parent, how to be a son, how to be a cousin, how to be a business owner, how to be a car driver, how to be a great swimmer, how to be a great runner, how to go on vacation. You let me know where you like to see him fit in. What do you say when somebody like this comes through the door? <laughs> <laughs> It's the same like a business card, right? I can, I'm an artist. I also repair television and also I'm a swim teacher. I give swimming lessons. No, and but I play accordion in my free time. You can do all these things, but when you want to actually sell something to a certain audience, you have to really think about what you're selling in just one thing. And that one thing is so important. That is your positioning. So when I make a pitch, I, 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 I tell you the whole blueprint and I give not, I hold nothing back. It's my what I do because the people who come to me, they don't want to do it themselves. But the people who listen now in, they can actually know because it might be interesting. And I, I have a free ebook at the very end where I repeat this blueprint just for those who really want to do it themselves. In other words, what to do themselves, who want to go and reach 5,000 people every week with about three hours of work in pitching, the booking, putting the ears, ears set on and talking and then wait until it's published. If you do this yourself, it's about three hours and I tell you you have a good strategy because you have to do it for many people. You have to go inside yourself and know yourself. Who are you? What kind of expertise, deep expertise do you have? Why would people actually interested? Why would do you think you bring something unique to the table of discussion, right? Yes, and, and from and that, why is it why is it that people take this shortcut all the time, though? Why are they not wanting to do the work? Because isn't that I mean, when somebody comes and gives me a really good pitch, I am ten times more inclined to at least check out if they are a good fit for the show. Versus somebody who I know is just copy and pasting. Why do people not want to take the time? Well, I think it has to do a little bit with intelligence. I mean, I would not say they're stupid, but I would say, first of all, they, because how long can you do something like this, which just annoys people? Like coming back, you don't, you are going on a podcast. You have to actually listen to a few episodes. And if you don't do it, then put it in ChatGDP and find everything out. What is this podcast about? So you can actually write a little bit of an icebreaker. The best is the icebreaker where you actually listen to an interesting interview. It's interesting, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, but then you have an icebreaker. Uh, then you say basically uh, what your bio is. And the bio, what you are in that bio has to be resonating, has to be correlating with the, the topics. You would be an excellent, fascinating interviewee on. And that's a three, four topics. And that all makes perfect sense with the audience, with the podcast host, everything. When I talk about Like my stuff, I can talk about business growth because, yes, when you want to grow in business, then, of course, you have to have also intelligent marketing strategies, more channels than normal, or find out better ones. Marketing is always testing. So if you didn't do it yet, go on a podcast tour. It might be really good for you because you get it's different than advertising on Facebook. So ultimately, then after this comes also a very important thing. I think that a podcast host looks at your thing. So few people, podcast hosts, get a real nice review. So if you have listened already 10 minutes to an interview, or well, 15 minutes, maybe the whole 90 minutes, uh, whatever, if you liked it, right? give them a nice review. It's like just you meet somebody in real life, like we meet in a restaurant, we were introduced. Do you want to right away talk about you all the time? I mean, first you talk about the other, you listen to the other person. That's what I'm saying when you do a positioning pitch. But then never, I never place anybody on that document who is not really relevant and brings immense value to the table of discussion. Yeah, I, I like this a lot. And the reason you want to do that is because you have no idea who I know. Like I happen to be exceptionally well connected. I mean, I've been in business for decades. I know a lot of people and I've done a lot of things for a lot of people. And if somebody gives me a great interview, a great product and treats me well, they will, of course, be on top of my mind because I always think about how can I help people that I've been, that have been guests on my show to further their business and to help even more people. And so from your perspective, when you talk to your clients or when clients come in, do you teach them this understanding? Is this a strategy that you actually teach them to follow or do they already know this and that's why you take them on as clients? I would say a lot of them, they're already a long time out, out there. And they understand the value of being always out there, never stop it, be always out there. I also say right away, you know, that, and, and I know, and I give some people, I give coaching, and I'm, I'm, I mention it, I stress it very much to see the podcasting tour as a valuable 
networking opportunity as well. And just what you said, I think this shows the character of a person. Because if I'm like with somebody, like with you, and already I studied you, I looked at your website, we are talking now. You go through all this work to interview me. I'm from uh, Mallorca. You are from California, Mallorca, Spain, and Ireland. And, you know, and you have done a lot to get this uh, off the ground. And I think immediately after this interview also, on do I know? And I know also quite a lot of people. I cannot of complain here. Yes, and big but people. I know I, I know podcast host <laughs> because that's my business. So when I say I was on that show and then I can quickly write an email or introduce you and what I get afterwards is that, yeah, let's wrap the podcast interview. And, you know, the podcast hosts, they don't get so often interviewed, but they are very, very smart people. And when they get a chance to get interviewed like this, they take, they also, they get more audience for their podcast. They get more audience for their business. So we definitely have this that we are reaching a wide audience because they make the numbers, get on 5,000 on podcasts with 3,000, 5,000 plus audience. Do it two, three times a month. Do this the whole year. You get an immense audience, right? But then again, you also really network. You network so much. Like when people look at me, when you look at me and you, let's say you would become a client of mine, you would say, this yourself, how is he doing it? Does he really know a lot of podcast hosts? But that's what you need to do when you do it a long time. You will have to know a lot of podcast hosts because as soon as you get a client in, you can immediately get him like five top level, high level, great podcasts and you don't have to do much. You just think, where would this client be a good guest? On? Yes, exactly. And and you and you establish a relationship with someone like me. And I know that if if somebody goes to a company like yours, an agency like yours, that they're willing to put money where their mouth is. So they're not throwing spaghetti at the wall. They know that they need to be deliberate. So I already know that there's a pre-vetting. So if something comes from a podcast podcasting agency, I I, I will. But I, I will say, in, in all fairness, not all podcasting agencies are, are good agencies. A lot of them do really sucky pitches. I think that there's a lot of the VA myth that you know, quantity over quality, which I really don't subscribe to. So Joseph, we talked a lot about now the strategy on why podcast guesting is powerful, how to borrow other people's audiences, how to create goodwill for referrals and things like that. One of the things that I found really fascinating about you is you studied divinity. Tell me about that. Yes, so, so let me just go narrow in. I was six years old and I was having a camping with some friends and I was talking about the universe. I got these answers, this question, and nobody was interested. And then I got the answer. And I said, what, this is a lonely journey if you're interested in this kind of things. So I got a spirit, well, small and my experience. When I came back from my travel from South America, I lived in the garden, I read something, uh, Upanishads, the Vedas, basically. And I got this experience. experience. Everybody read them, knows what, it, what I'm talking about. <laughs> and then I said, I'm going to India. So I went two years to India, but in India, from there, I also, you know, I had a really, very adventurous life. I forgot about spirituality, but I just wanted to trench. I was like 21, 22. Then I started it because when I came back from Aust I do Austria and I was a tourist guide there, I was thinking there are so many people in India, they are kind of gurus and they could brainwash you and they could manipulate you. I want to go to the university. And I want to actually read those scriptures and I want to know for myself. And I don't want to become a guru or something like this. I just want to be solid in my own understanding. So academically, there's so many people that just talk about it. But you know, you should know the scriptures of Hinduism, and Buddhism, and you talk about it. Or Taoism. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. You don't want necessarily always a middleman. They are also nice. They are poets. Like Hermann Hessen, they write wonderfully. However, you want to go to the actual source for yourself. Do yourself a favor, basically. Yeah, so before, so what are you saying is before you listen to any guru, go to the original text and just read it yourself, which is really not that difficult to do and see what it actually says. And before it's, re, before it's been reinterpreted 16 times. Yes, and also the gurus, you look, you know, they're really they're wonderful gurus. I mean, they're so famous. They talk so yes. beautifully. But look at the people. They are going there on a retreat, 30 days, whatever, 20 days. They tell everybody how much they paid for it. And that's all good. I mean, but... I have not met anybody who comes from them, who for me at least, that they talk always about you have to get rid of your ego or whatever, and I see the biggest ego in the world. You know, I just I, I just don't believe that that it helps, really. I think 
what really helps is to be really close to your your little Mr. Emotions from childhood. That being with you, when you are starting to ignore this emotion from yourself, you go in all kinds of directions and that's not good. You have to stay in the moment. And I think that's so much better. I I would not suggest that uh, anybody has to absolutely look outside themselves. I mean to get to get probably some hammer on from the universe. And why do you look outside yourself? It's all, it's all in there. You and I had a fascinating conversation about a concept around harmonizing and mindfulness. So I would love for you to share this with the beehive a little bit. What does it mean to harmonize your life? Well, life comes in a duality, many dualities. They go left and right and up and down dualities. That's the thing to understand life. In Hinduism, for instance, they say this is never going away. In our Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, there's no good or bad or in other words, I don't say this is better or this is not. I'm just saying that's what the reality is. They say the, the good has to win over the evil. Whereas in Hinduism, life would always be like this, right? So the, har the harmony is to understand with equanimity. Like there is a wonderful saying in China, it's called the Chinese farmer. When I tell this saying to a friend, and I use it all the time for myself, that shows that you have to go through life with complete equanimity. The Chinese farmer is a horse, his horse runs away. All the neighbors came and they say, oh, you 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 have a terrible experience. Yes. That's incredible. You know, your only horse ran away. You're so misfortunate. And he says, maybe. He always says, maybe. Then the horse comes back with wild horses the next day. So all the, all the neighbors come again and say, well, you really are the happiest, world, <laughs> the happiest guy in the world, you know. And he's calm, equanimity. And he says, maybe. Then his son comes and rides one of those wild horses and he breaks his leg terribly. So all the neighbors come again, same story again, right? And then comes the army, just the last thing I say now. The army comes and they recruit young man. Of course, his son is not being recruited. What that means is, that is for me harmony. The harmony in life. You you live in a life which is duality. And what do you have to learn? You expand your consciousness here. But it wouldn't exist the life as we know it if there wouldn't be this these things. Like, this happens to you, but you don't know. You cure it very bad. But in 10 years or in 5 years or tomorrow already, it could have been the best thing that ever happened to you. Like a divorce. I'm just saying. Uh, I'm just saying an uh, example. Yeah. And or or the the, the the farmer, the son, his son, right? He breaks his leg, and the next day comes the army, and then something good happens to you. Very good happens to you. The lottery. My God, you have millions of dollars now, but you make terrible mistake with the money. You had no idea, right? So I just want to say this is a harmony for me. Harmony is to recognize that you cannot go into the extremes, and that's actually the middle way from the taught by the Buddha, the first sermon he gave, the Buddha, the actual historical Buddha, he, ta he talked about the middle way, avoid the extremes, find the middle. And that's basically harmony. Yeah, in, in the book of Ash, I, I did read this one story and it says that the person who smokes is no different than the person who doesn't smoke at all because there is no middle because you replace one extreme with the other extreme and there's no learning. And smoking might not be the best example, but it's an example in the book. That always stuck with me because I I believe that the, the mastery of something isn't to do or not do it, but to find on how to balance or harmonize how you call the both of them. My next question to you is, why does this matter in business? Because people, may say that's all nice and well joseph you do that in your spare time you, you study divinity you harmonize your life but when it comes to business we all hard charging we need to grow our authority scale our impact we need to move forward what does this have to do with success in your opinion i think it has to do a lot with success because you know you cannot be successful if you do it the wrong way you will be very unhappy you become 40 45 and you're successful and something is missing. Now, why this has to do with, with the spirituality? You cannot be really happy in spirituality if you're always proud either. Now, you might be very uh, highly uh, enlightened person, but if you you're proud all the time, you cannot pay yes. the price. Yes, exactly. So, <clears throat> you know, again, we talk about harmony, right? So ultimately, I think it's very important for the person who goes after success to understand one huge distinction. And that's both respectable and to be honored in yourself. You created a persona, you created a mask, a public mask. That's a good thing, but you always have to know who is behind that mask. When you're that successful manager, the successful businessman, and you are 
that influencer or you are that and you forget this you will be very empty after a while when you when you are you can you have to really look at who am i inside where do i get my energy from who is this playing this game in the world and that's where again spirituality helps not playing now too much in from ancient philosophers but hinduism talks clearly about it about the world of maya <clears throat> we are enjoying maya which is the world of illusion we are enjoying it all and ultimately it all gets us to expand our consciousness and to grow but grow growth is a very important word because there is no life without growth and so even in spirituality or in biology and nowhere you can say this is growing if it's not if it's spiritual this is actually everything dies and stagnates if it's not growing maybe the owners say okay i'm not i don't grow anymore but you know what the competitors will grow and somehow you have to always grow things in life in this world right otherwise you're not growing it anymore it goes down 100 well i do believe that there's a really a, a big point you're making we always look at nature and we look at the concepts of science and nature and if the concept doesn't exist in nature then it probably doesn't work and if you are looking at nature in spring the plants are all in nobody's holding anything back it's grow time that's it there's no like well it's a little hectic for me spring gets way too busy i'm just going to do a couple leaves the, the tree is all in because that's what it does and then when it loses it, it it leaves it loses all its leaves and it goes like well it's winter now it's time to be quiet for a while i think that people also oftentimes try to be smarter than nature or try to be smarter than these energetic concepts that that exist and when you talk to people i, I want to talk to you just a little bit about that when you learn in when you talked in your spiritual ventures or adventures to the wise men do you find that there are parallels between science physics and religion or spirituality is it connected yes it's terribly connected i mean I, you know, I, I'm not saying the gurus are, are, are not intelligent people. They are, but I wouldn't try and rush them. Some people, maybe it's good for them, right? but let's say Eckhart Tolle. I listen sometimes to YouTube videos of, of different or like everybody who is interested in the topic or, or Instagram. Because I started it, so I clearly quickly see something inspiring. Maybe it's just 30 seconds, but it could be. So what he said one day in his book, the famous book, what is it called? Something. The Power of Now. The Now. The Power of Now, exactly. Very good book. And he says this, that... He makes a distinction between life, he says, is not birth and death. In other words, so many people make that have this fallacy to think about, like in nature. You're going through the forest, and what you see in the forest, if you go there every day all year long, you will see birth and death. And the whole thing is called life. I, I thought this is very beautiful. And that is what you just said. That's nature, that's science, that is also very much philosophy or I mean, it's just just an example. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with you. I think the longer I'm 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 in this, the more I realize that people always say the journey is the reward, and that makes no sense until a certain point in your life where you really recognize that it is about the moments that you have in between, and that you have to make these moments m mean something. My daughter is coming down with my grandchild. So I booked myself out because I want to be present for this time with her because it really matters to me. A year ago, I may have been a little less easy about it because it would have taken away from me working more, right? So I think the litmus test, Joseph, for me always is if, you, if your family's in the way of you working more, then there's something that's not harmonic in your life. Because the harmony is that when these moments happen, where your family comes in and people get so stressed out over holidays and family events and things like that, but that's the now, that's the moment. That's when everybody comes together. Sure, it's a lot of work and dishes and shopping and expensive and the uncle and the cousin and the alcoholic friend and, and whatever it is, but that's the power of now. That's the now I think we're living in. in these are the stories that we tell. We never tell the story. You know what? In 1998, I was working a lot and I got so much out of it. Says nobody ever because you can't even freaking remember. But you will say 1998, whatever, my son is born or 
or we got married or we went on an amazing trip. That's what you sort of remember. So I, I like this reminder of uh, what you just said, that you really need to be not looking at the bookends of your life, but at what's between the bookends. Yeah, very powerful. All right. So for somebody, Yosef, that now is going like, well, this guy is unique and different and I should take a look into on whether podcast guesting is a strategy that I should be employing for my business. Where do we send them? To my ebook, my free ebook. It doesn't, you don't even have to give an email, but you will see also my website. But when you go there and when you read it, you will right away say, see something which is quite logic, the way I do it. And you can learn it really fast and you will save tons of time doing it. And you will get to the best podcast. It's all in that little book. So, you go to guestexpertsonair.com forward slash podcast promo like promotion podcast promo guestexpertsonair.com forward slash podcast promo. You will like it. Excellent. Very simple. One call to action, which is what we like. Uh, Yosef, it's been amazing to have you on the show. Thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your strategic and spiritual concepts with our audience. Yeah, that was a privilege. Thank you so much. Uh, my pleasure. And that's it for us today. So again, remember, podcast guesting is a strategy that I use, that I recommend all of my clients. I like Joseph's concept of a podcast tour to think about if you don't want to do it on an on, as an ongoing strategy to do it for a particular type of purpose for a particular type of time. That's my takeaway that I don't have to always think in eternity and perpetuity. I can also think about it for a particular type of a time and space. And I, of course, always love spiritual concepts because har harmony is important for you, our wonderful listeners, to feel good about where you are at right now. And that's what we're here for. And again, we're grateful, we're humbled, we're thankful that you're here. And until next time, and goodbye. So appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for listening to the entire episode. Please subscribe to the podcast. Give us a five-star review, a comment, and share this episode with one more person so that you can help us help more people. Thank you again. Until next time. Goodbye.